I know that uh, most of you are aware that Jamie wanted to spend time with Carlin and his new beautiful baby girl, and we don't blame him for that. He's going to be taking some vacation time, so for the next week or so, I'll be stepping in and, and taking the pulpit. And I, I just want to tell you, we're going to be talking about the family. I knew more about raising children and being a parent at 19 when I first began preaching than I do now. But uh, I hope that we can talk about some things that would be encouraging to both those that are young parents and those that are grandparents and just remind us about some of the things that we need to be a part of. Barry, I appreciate your prayer and, and I do hope we can understand there are some things we can do. And I hope this evening, I, I want to share with you some of the basics for the family that I find God's Word teaching. If you have your Bibles, turn over with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. While you're turning there, I, I want to mention that we had the service at the Assisted Living Home in Blue Ridge today. There were 62 people that came out and were there. Almost all the residents that are there on Sunday afternoon come out and worship with us and they participate. And it's encouraging to, uh, to have uh, brothers and sisters to come and to be there to worship with us. But we want you to, to plan to go and to be there. It's a great facility. It's a wonderful opportunity. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this for some time in the future. Uh, but I uh, do hope you'll make it a point to, uh, to try to come and to uh, visit, at least uh, see what you might be able to do. You know, it's one thing for us to talk about Bible study, and it's, it's true, we need to be in the book. But let me just tell you something. Folk, it's time that we get some action with the Word that we know God tells us. We're having problems getting people to sign up to open and close the building. We need you to step up. Sunday afternoon, we need you to step up. It, it's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, it only takes an hour or so to go and be a part of that worship service but it's an opportunity God has opened a door for us and we need you to help us to take advantage of it. And it sure would be encouraging to look next month and have more people from LJ than there are from any of the other congregations. I, I do hope you'll think about that. It, it, there's a lot of things we can do to step up and, and I just hope that we'll look for the way to do this. We're gonna be looking at Deuteronomy chapter six and, and I'm sure there are a lot of things that come to mind when we read the Old Testament. I'm reading from the English Standard Version but I wanna share with you the writings of Moses. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you're going over to possess it. That you may fear the Lord your God you and your son, your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, and a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Listen, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give you, with great and good seas that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and, and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God that you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst as a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from all the face of the earth. You shall not put your Lord to the test as you tested him, Messiah. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimony and his statutes, which he has commanded you. I want us to stop there just for a moment. You know, God talks here about our faithfulness. 
He's talking about us realizing the importance of our relationship with Him. I know that uh, I'm encouraged when I think about the, the faithfulness of my grandparents, of my mom, my dad. Today's my brother Rick's birthday. I think about the faithfulness that was shared with us and hopefully that we can pass down not only to our children, our grandchildren, but you know, folks, we need to go back and, and realize that forgetting can be a dangerous thing. I know many of you have heard me talk about uh, an illustration that, well, I'm just happy to be here. When we were preaching in Columbus years ago, we had an old refrigerator we kept out on the back porch, the back breezeway, and it had a terrible plug on it. And one Saturday I decided I was going to put a new plug on that refrigerator. It was plugged into an extension cord. I actually went in the house to unplug that extension cord to do the job, and the phone rang. And after about a 30-minute phone conversation, I hung up and thought, well, did I unplug that? Surely I did. It's what I went in the house for. So I took a pair of utility scissors, and I clamped down to cut through that wire, and I had not unplugged it. Standing on concrete barefooted, and if you want to know why I act funny sometimes, that's why. It, uh, Susan could have uh, heard me shout uh, if she'd been a half mile away. I hollered. Just luckily that I went all the way through. If I had not clamped down as hard as I did, it would have gotten me. It would have held on. And uh, boy, from that time on, let me tell you, I'm one of those people that I do extra careful things around electricity. I don't like to be shocked. My granddad was home. Uh, I was staying with him when I was about five or six years old, and the, re and the television was unplugged. There had been a terrible accident at Copper Hill. One of the electricians had been electrocuted. He actually had, I believe, a either it was a screwdriver or a pair of pliers in his back pocket and he went by a hot wire and, and it touched and it took his life. I remember that was the supper time conversation at our house for a day or two and what a terrible thing it was. But that Saturday afternoon, I remember my granddad telling me, be careful plugging that in, you'll get electrocuted. Well, in plugging that TV into the wall, I got shocked. And I remember yelling and crying and telling my granddad, oh, I know I'm going to die. I've been electrocuted. My granddad laughed, and every time he ever thought about that, his entire laugh, it got a chuckle out of him his whole life. You know, forgetting things can be dangerous. And I, I can just tell you that uh, you forget to put oil in your car, you can ruin a motor. Forget to put water in a car, you can lock the motor down. There's just some things you can't forget. You know, if you turn an eye on the stove, you can burn the house down. That, that's something that many of you have discovered. But, folks, if you forget things that are important, it can be costly. Men, have you ever forgotten an anniversary or maybe a birthday? Those are things you don't want to forget. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God is telling us that we want to have the kind of family that he would desire for us, that he would have us to have, there's some things we need to remember. And, oh, you and I need to remember certain things, and we need to teach them to our families, and that means to our children and to our grandchildren and those that we can possibly teach. It's up to us to be that person that's going to share with them. Well, somebody says, well, what do we need to teach? I really believe Deuteronomy chapter 6 gives us some ideas of some of the things that are important that you and I need to be sharing. No, there was a Sunday school teacher that had uh, some four and five-year-olds, and they'd been talking about the 23rd Psalm, and the teacher didn't really know if they were listening, and so she finally asked one day, said, uh, what, uh, what does this Psalm say? And one little girl said, oh, I can tell you. I can tell you exactly what the 23rd Psalm is. The Lord is my shepherd. That's all that I want. Well, if we'd be that smart, if we'd understand that that's really what we need to be about. You see, we live in an R-rated world, and we see this everywhere. We can see it uh, in the middle of LJ. You can see it at the shopping center. You can see it at the grocery stores. 
Folks, there are so many things happening. I, I know uh, I, I noticed a post yesterday on social media that was talking about some of the language at the ball game Friday night. Some of the kids, the young kids, were saying some words out loud in, in talking about some of the things happening on the football field. And, and, and this parent said, I finally had to say something because my little children were sitting there. It should never be a problem. But that's the, the world we live in. That's some of the things that's happening. And God forbid it be any of our children. But let me just say to you, God gives us some ideas here, some things we need to be about. And, and God told Israel to teach their families the very concept that, that we put Him first, that we acknowledge God, and that uh, God reminded them of where they'd been. He reminded them they'd been slaves over in Egypt, and He brought them out. He delivered them. I, I want to ask you, have you thought recently of where God has brought us from as individuals? And just think, you know, God had given them blessings that they didn't deserve. He, he talks here about the fact that they were wells, they hadn't dug, there were houses, they hadn't built, there were vineyards, they hadn't planted, and yet they were able to enjoy the, the things that God had bestowed upon them. But it was all conditional upon them loving the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and all their mind. And folk, there are commands and decrees that God expects us to keep. There are some things that he asks of us, and we're looking at the Old Testament, but the principle applies even today with you and I. We have to remember what he's trying to tell us. God was asking them to put, them, put him first in every area of their life. Now, that's so important today when we look about and we can see all that's going on. Parents, let me suggest to you, I found this, and you might have heard it a long time ago, but 10 ways you can turn your kids off to church. I, there was a late night talk show person that used to have lists, top 10 of this and top 10 of that. Well, here are the 10 things you can do to turn your kids off to church. Number one, well, number 10, let's start this way. We'll go backwards. Schedule personal or family events to conflict with church services and activities. Go ahead and let everything else take precedent over being in God's house at service time. Number nine, don't get too close to anybody in church. Refrain from building relationships with other Christians in God's house. Number eight, look often at your watch during worship and complain bitterly. Look annoyed or freak out if services go over time. Number seven, Financially support your church and its mission with the same enthusiasm that you pay your taxes. I like that one. Number six, do the best you can to make sure your kids arrive on time for ball practice, for school events, but don't worry if they're late to church services. Number five, bring your family to church only when, A, when you have nothing better to do. Number B, you have a personal need. Or number C, you feel guilty. Number four, don't volunteer for anything or make any kind of long-term commitment to the church. You know, you've got to keep your options open. There are other things that might be more important. Number three, change churches every few years. Number two, remind your kids how imperfect the church leaders are and regularly point out their mistakes. Number one, Whatever you do, don't let the church influence the way you live your life. Those are 10 ways you can turn your kids off to worship and to the church. One of the gentlemen that had so much influence in the 20th century was a Jewish boy by the name of Karl Marx. Karl Marx's father was Jew who sold his family and his friends out to the Germans. Karl Marx has written many things, and a lot of the things that have happened in our society and our culture is the result of the teachings of Karl Marx. It all happened because his father sold out his family and his faith. You know, we need to realize the devil understands this. 
He's going to do everything he can to have us sell our faith out to the highest bidder. But let me suggest to you, secondly, God promises that if we put him first in our family, there's blessings that we're going to enjoy. Sometimes we might not talk about the benefits of our Christianity. I really hope that we'll stop and understand that, uh, well, Jesus himself said in this world we're going to have troubles. We're going to face sickness and we're going to face the hardships. We're going to face death because we live in a, in a fallen world. But at the same time, Deuteronomy 6 tells us that even when bad things happen to us, there are some good things that we have to look at. You know, if we strive to put Jesus and God first in our lives, looking at Deuteronomy 6, there are some promises. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, he reminds us that you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to your fathers. You know what he's saying? It would go well with us. This has been a year for my family. From knee replacement surgery to Jenny's surgery to pancreatic, uh, the pancreatitis. And it's just been one of those times. But let me say, I've never felt that God's doing it or God's responsible for it. I really believe that God's Word tells us there are some things that we have in store for us. In verse 24 of this chapter, he tells us, The Lord commanded us to do all the statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. No, I hope that we can understand that there are some things God has promised us. I love Hebrews the 13th chapter where he tells us he's never going to leave us and he's not going to forsake us. Just think about no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what our problems or what our troubles or what our joys are, if we're on the mountaintop, God has brought us there and he's promised to stay with us. No, here he talks about the fact that, well, there's some satisfaction in life. In verse 11, going back, he said, in the houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees you did not plant, and when you eat and are full. You know, God talks about the fact that we can be satisfied. I really think that part of our world today, there's a large portion of people that just can't be, quote, satisfied. Doesn't seem no matter how they prospered or how good things are or how blessed our families are, they just can't find that satisfying deed in their life. But folk, when we are striving to live the life God wants us to live, there's some satisfaction that can come. We can live a satisfied life. And I really believe he tells us why. Verse 25, he reminds us and says, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all his commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. I really think that we can look and can understand. But this keep in mind, what's it dependent upon? It's dependent upon us not only taking God's word into our lives, but our living it, of our sharing it, of our putting it out to our families. No, thirdly, so that all we need to think about is how do we put him first? How do we put him first? Parents, how do you impress your kids? I can, uh, can tell you there's a lot of things I remember from my childhood. I can remember encouraging people. I can remember those, those members that of the church that encouraged me when I was in kindergarten age and first and second grade. And I can think back to those people today and how thankful I am that they spoke encouraging words. We never get too old to try to encourage even the youngest of our, our family. But let me just remind you that, you know, there are some things he suggests here, and that is that we put God's word out there. It's not enough, and I'm sure we've all remember this. I heard a preacher not long ago talking about the fact he used to go into homes and every family had a family Bible. It was one of those big coffee table renditions of the, of the Bible. And, and 
they didn't really look like they'd ever been read very much, and most of the time that's where people kept their important papers. It was used more for a file cabinet than anything else. But, you know, almost every, every family when I was a child had one of those family Bibles. We don't need to worry about that kind of family Bible. What we need to do is to have one that looks well-worn and well-used. You see, God wants us to impress our faith on our families, starting with our children and then our grandchildren. We need to talk about our faith. We need to talk about it at the dinner table. We need to talk about it when we're sitting in our living rooms and our bedrooms. Wherever we go, we need to be willing to talk about it. You know, here Moses talks about the fact that they were to tie their hands with it. They were to bind it on their foreheads. They were to write it on the door frame. But you know what these things are talking about? They're talking about action things, doing things. We need to put our faith in action. It's not enough that we tell our kids. We need to show our kids our faith by the way that we live. You know, uh, there are some basics that we can do. We can go to church regularly. We can attend the services. We can be faithful in that. We can be faithful in reading our Bible. We can be faithful in praying. We can be faithful in, in doing the acts of worship. And how joyful is it you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 tells us that whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. You what? You proclaim. Even as we came today and, and gathered around the table, we did so remembering, proclaiming what Jesus has done. You know, Deuteronomy 6, verse 7 reminds us we are to impress our faith on our children. I would only hope that... Uh, We'd be faithful to do that. And, and you know, I, I can tell you this. When I was a child, I used to enjoy listening to my parents, my grandparents, to a lot of aunts and uncles when they would start talking about the old stories, the family stories. I thought about that a great deal. Parents, have your kids ever heard you talk about the church, about your faith. We are studying the book of Acts in here on Sunday morning. We're about to conclude the study, but one of the things we noted, and we studied Acts 26 today, the Apostle Paul before King Agrippa. You know what Paul did over and over and over again? He told his story. He told about his conversion. And I would hope every Christian should be able to tell their story of what they did to become a child of God. That's the same story we not only need to share with our children, but it's the same story we need to share with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors. It's not something new. It's not something hard. It's just what we did. Paul told that story over. That was his sermon over and over and over again. He told his story. I mentioned the Bible class this morning. If, if they couldn't tell me their story, we need to sit down and talk about it. And I'll just say to you, if you can't tell me what you did to become a part of God's family, maybe we need to sit down with the book and look to make sure you did what God wanted you to do. You should know your story. And that was what God's telling the children of Israel to do here. They're simply to tell their children and their grandchildren his commandments, His word, what they were rejoicing about because they had been brought out of slavery down in Egypt and God had delivered them. You know, we have to tell about our faith. We have to have the kind of faith that's going to be important to us. There's an illustration that I, I heard a long time ago and I have used it here. Back in 1988 in Armenia, there was an earthquake and there was a family that lived there. Armand was the young man's name that was a student. His parents, Samuel and Danell, sent them to school that day. And, well, that day before he left, Samuel looked his son in the eye and he said, Have a good day at school. And remember, no matter what, I'll always be, I'll always be with you. And that morning there was an earthquake. The school was left in shambles. 
You know, the story's told that when it happened, Samuel grabbed his coat and he ran down the, to the schoolyard where this building had fallen in. There were a lot of fatalities. There were a lot of children that were injured, a lot of teachers that were, were killed. Armand stood there. Samuel stood there and he thought about his promise to his son. And he started digging in the rubble. And one of the parents looked at him and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm digging for my son. And they said, well, you're only going to make matters worse. And there's no, not any way that, that Armand could have lived through this. And Samuel told them, I'm going to find my son. No, the firefighters and those others that came to the scene couldn't understand. He begged them, won't you help me? But the firefighters left. He kept digging. All through that night and the next day, Samuel kept digging in that rubble. And finally, finally he reached a point where he stopped to rest and he heard a cry, help, help. He listened. And Samuel cried out. He heard a voice that was muffled. Papa. Samuel had survived. He was alive. Armand had made it through that earthquake and he laid there in the rubble. Finally, Samuel began to dig. He, he finally got his son. He said, come on out, son. And he said, no, let the other children come first. I know you'll get me. And child after child that was in the classroom with, with Armand came out of that, that rubble that day. You know, I told the other kids not to worry. I told them not to be too afraid that I knew you would come for me because you told me you would. You know, Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and verse 4, and Paul instructs us that we're to bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I think about things I'd done differently when I was a young father. Thought about things I'd do differently since I'm a grandfather. But folks, we've got to keep on doing what we know is right. And when we stumble, when we fall, we need to get up and keep digging, keep trying, and make sure we're doing what God wants us to do. Our families are the most precious thing that God's given us here. What are we going to do with them? You know, it's a sad time. I, I've heard recently that we're losing 75% of those growing up in the church that are leaving the faith. I don't know if that's an accurate number. I pray it's not. But folks, it has to start somewhere. It has to start with us. And it has to start with our doing what God wants us to do. Yes, we need to study the book. We need to put it into action. We need to make sure that we show our kids our faith. Tonight, if you're here and you're not a part of God's family, we invite you to come. We encourage you to come. It begins right there. What more can you do to help your child, your children, your grandchildren than to start with you? Having faith in Jesus as God's Son. Come and repent of your sins. Confess them to the world. Have your sins washed away. And if you're part of God's family and you're away, why not come back and be restored to your rightful place in the family? Deuteronomy 6 gets all over my toes. Don't mind telling you, every time I read it, I think about the, the short sightings that I've had in my life. But folk, it don't stop ringing out. We're to let God's Word have a place in our lives, not just on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, but every day, 24-7, 365, it's got to be that way. If your life's not right with God, we want you to come while together we stand and sing. Walk in the master's way, calling you today, Jesus, the light of the world, valley, mountains high, walk in
in a narrow way. Won't you come home to the master's hand? Walk in the light of the day. Walk in the light. He is the light. Come and his will obey. Swiftly the hours are passing by. Tomorrow may be too late. Won't you now hear his tender plea? He is a living way, cleansing from every sinful stain. How could he love me so? Washed in the blood and Calvary, where living waters flow, calling you today, Jesus, the light of the world, valley, mountains high, walk in the narrow way, won't you come home to the Walk in the 